problem number six. I want to find theta and c in each picture. It does say give exact answers, and that makes me think, well, then these must be special triangles. Otherwise, I'd have to use the calculator. So look at part A closely. What I see is I've got this side 4, negative 4, and then I've got this other side that's root 3 times as long. Well, immediately then I know I'm dealing with a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Those are the ones where if the short side is x, the medium side is x root 3, and the long side is 2x, the double of the short side. So the c then must be 8. Again, this is a 30, 60, 90. The 60 is opposite the root 3 side, which means, of course, theta, that larger angle there, is just 60 degrees short of 180. In other words, it's 120 degrees. We are supposed to give our angles in radians, so I will write that as 2 pi over 3, and part A is finished. I could have used trig here, but I would still have to know those values, so what I probably would have done is called this little angle alpha and just worked with the triangle, ignoring the quadrants and the negatives and all that. So I could have written tangent alpha is 4 root 3 over 4. But I would still have to, when I got to this point, recognize, oh, root 3, that's one of my common ratios. That's the one that I get when alpha is 60 degrees. And then from there, of course, I could get the rest. Part B, what I notice immediately is that the two legs have the same length. They're both length 24. The only way that happens in a right triangle is if you have a 45, 45, 90 triangle. Well, that makes this a pretty simple problem. Theta is 45 degrees short of one full revolution. That's 315 degrees. Or in radians, that would be 7 pi over 4. And then the C I can get from using the 45, 45, 90 pattern. In that pattern, the hypotenuse is always root 2 times as much as one of the legs. So C must be 24 root 2. Of course, I could have found C using the Pythagorean theorem. I could have found theta by setting up a trig ratio, as we were talking about. But I think the way I worked the problem is the simplest way to go. Problem number seven. So the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared represents a circle in the xy plane with a center of 0, 0, and a radius of r. So take a look at all these circles. We just want to say what the radius is. Remember, the number over here is not the radius. It's the radius squared. To get the radius, you would just have to take the square root. Here, the radius would be 2. Now, the r squared is 20. The radius would be the square root of 20, which simplifies to 2 square root of 5. We are giving exact answers here. And here, the r squared is 83. And so the radius is just square root of 83. Now in part b, we want to go backwards. So we want to write the equation of the circle if we have the radius. Well, in the first one, if r is 10, then obviously the r squared would be 100. So x squared plus y squared equals 100. In the second one, if r is the square root of 17, I just have to square that for the equation. Squaring a square root just wipes it out. And so I would get x squared plus y squared equals 17. In the third example, I need to square that radius. 3 times 3 is 9. Root 7 times root 7 is 7. 9 times 7 gives me 63. And so I would have here x squared plus y squared equals 63. And then problem number 8. Remember from algebra the definition of the imaginary unit i. i is the square root of negative 1. You can use that to simplify square roots in the world of imaginary and complex numbers. So square root of negative 4, I can think of this as square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1. Well, square root of 4 is 2. Square root of negative 1 is i. This is equal to 2i. For square root of negative 50, Again, I can break the 50 up, as usual, into 25 and 2. 
and then I've got that extra negative 1. So square root of 25 is 5, square root of negative 1 is i, the 2 gets left behind. 5i square root of 2. i squared is the third problem. Well, if i is the square root of negative 1, when you square a square root, it makes that square root go away. So i squared would just be equal to negative 1. This becomes useful when you're working with quadratic equations. So if I want to solve this for x, again, in the world of complex numbers, I can square root each side. Don't forget the plus or minus. And then I can simplify this the same way we were just doing. That negative on the inside is going to come out as an i. And of course, the square root of 9 is equal to 3. And so my two solutions here are positive 3i and negative 3i. I can do something similar in this second example. So square root, square root, don't forget the plus or minus. On the left, the square root wipes out the squared, so I have x minus 2. On the right, I have plus or minus, square root of 36 is 6, and that negative comes out as an i. And then to solve for x, all I need to do is add 2 to both sides. Final answers, x equals 2 plus or minus 6i. In other words, one answer is 2 plus 6i, and the other answer is 2 minus 6i.